Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's session on the Rastafari religion, brought to us by Brian Carwana of Encounter World Religions. I would like to take this time to introduce Brian Carwana, and what I'm going to do is read you his bio as it appears on the Encounter World Religions website. It has to be the most unique bio that I've ever read. Brian is the religious geek. He studies religions, visits religions, visits religious communities, and is friends with many religious leaders. He thinks about religion in the shower. It's relentless. As director of Encounter World Religions, he loves teaching about religions, about ethno-religious diversity, and what it means in our modern workplaces, schools, and societies. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you now, Brian Carwan. Thanks, Scott. Uh, yeah, uh, most unique. Weird would be another word for unique. It's a kind of a synonym, so uh, how, however you want that. Uh, okay, folks, thanks, uh, thanks for being here. I think I do have actually a handout with this class. Um, so I will, uh, I'll send it to Kathy and Scott after this is over and hopefully they can um, distribute it to you, you know, uh, those of you who are here, okay? Okay, uh, Rastafari, I'm, I'm glad to teach you about this. I don't get to teach this class that often. People don't know much about Rastafarians and what they do know are one or two sort of, um, I don't know, one or two quick things that, you know, you can pop words out, right? Like kind of popcorn words and people say marijuana, dreadlocks and um, um, uh, the reggae musician, uh, Bob Marley, right? And then people are usually sort of done. Um, so I'm hoping at the end of this class that you realize um, that there's much more to this tradition. Okay, so Rastafari, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God. What are our objectives? Our objectives are as follows. Uh, we want to examine uh, Rasta's roots in black power and biblical messianism, because uh, it does really draw from both of these a lot, as you're going to see. We're going to explore some of the key figures. There's some really um, interesting personalities in the Rasta history, and also to learn some of the Rasta terminology. It sort of has its own language, if you will. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to examine some of the main teachings and main beliefs of the Rasta tradition and some of the main practices. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in about an hour. Uh, geographically, our story is going to move around. We're going to have four different locales we're going to call upon. We're going to talk about Ethiopia. We're going to talk about uh, the Holy Land, the land of Israel. Of Israel. Uh, we will talk about Jamaica, uh, and we're going to talk about the United States. Our story starts uh, in Africa um, with slavery. This is uh, in Senegal, Africa. This is called the Door of No Return. Many slaves, uh, as they were captured in Africa, would be brought here uh, brought into this room, and this is the last thing they would see of Africa. They would go out this door on directly onto a ship uh, and never see Africa again. It's a place you can go visit. I, I've seen images of the Obamas there. Um, you know, many people's lives were forever changed in this room. And they were put on these ships, and uh, as you know, uh, even the voyage over was horrific. They were packed like sardines. There were massive losses of human life on the journey over. They would just throw them into the sea. We have all these sort of images of how they were uh, treated as less than humans. Uh, and of course, when they're brought to the new land, uh, again, dehumanized, sometimes stripped so that they could be assessed very much like someone assessing you as if you're, you know, an animal or something like that. Uh, there were auction houses for this sort of thing, uh, men and women as well. Uh, and of course, uh, brutalization. Uh, sometimes they would randomly grab every 10th or 12th slave and thrash them, which is done this way. Um, you can imagine being this poor man on the ground, how it was just to terrorize people, right? Uh, there is this famous image of this man, this uh, who um, former slave with his back, um, you know, unbelievably marked. Uh, even after slavery was over, uh, the violence continued. And we think of it often in the South, but it was in the North too. This is Duluth, Minnesota. You can see that the mob there um, killed some some black uh, some uh, black people. Um, in uh, in this is in June 1920 in in the north. And these things were not done at night secretly. Uh, the crowd was estimated at five to ten thousand people. Right, this is in Minnesota. They just lynched somebody. There are thousands of witnesses, but no one no one gets arrested. 
Um, there was another event like this that happened in Waco, Texas. Um, I removed some other images that I have shown in the past because I've, I've always struggled with whether to show them. I'm not going to show them to you, but there are images of these people dead, hung, that are close up and people are like posing for the camera. One of them, uh, they literally, I'm not kidding you, they, they, made, um, they made postcards of them. They're postcards of people, um, you know, the white crowd and there's like a uh, boyfriend and girlfriend holding hands in the front and uh, sometimes there's kids and they're wearing their Sunday clothes. And, and there's there's a dead man hanging right you know right behind them or above them. It, it's just unbelievable. Uh, so this stuff was not hidden, right? The KKK uh, marched in Washington, men um, and women. They were leaders of society. You knew who they were. And of course, uh, after slavery, uh, when that had been de uh, defeated in the Civil War, uh, they enacted Jim Crow laws. Uh, Jim Crow was a vaudeville character. Uh, he was, um, uh, it would be a white actor playing the role uh, who was wearing what's called blackface. And the character was, um, you know, slow witted. He was uh, kind of shuffled around. Um, I think it was, his name often was, was Jim Negro. And so you get Jim Crow laws. Uh, and the, and those, the, of course, these laws, uh, the whole law, the, the vaudeville character becomes the name of these laws that discriminate against blacks, right? So Jim Crow laws meant um, that you often had to sit separate, you had separate restaurants, separate um, water fountains, all sorts of places that say uh, you can't come in here. Uh, a lot of the story I'm telling is from the United States. Uh, in Jamaica, uh, there was slavery as well. It was slightly different in Jamaica. Instead of cotton, they grew sugarcane, and sugarcane is far more labor intensive than cotton. And what this means is that in Jamaica, uh, the relative population was much higher. There was a higher number of blacks compared to whites. And in 1831, this led to a great slave revolt. Uh, the additional numbers made this, you know, a greater possibility. And it was eventually put down, um, but it was, uh, in some respects, effective in the long run because a few years later um, they ended slavery. Okay, and so um, in the fertile cultural, I want to talk. We're going to start in Jamaica because. Uh, Jamaica, uh, it is where the story begins at some level, uh, and there's fertile cultural soil there. Uh, we have here the history of oppression, uh, of enslavement, and even after slavery was ended, Blacks were still oppressed, right? They didn't own the means of production. They, they didn't own power. So there's a history of oppression in Jamaica, but also a history of Black resistance, of this slave revolt um, that, you know, really um, changed society. Uh, and of course, uh, the presence of uh, Christian themes, of biblical themes, the themes of emancipation, right? Uh, Moses freeing the people, things like that, and the history of messianism, of messiah-like figures like Moses and Jesus. And it is into this fertile cultural soil that oppression, resistance, and biblical themes emerges a most unusual man, Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey, uh, you know, Scott at the beginning was talking about a unique bio, this really is a bio of one person. There is no one else quite like Marcus Garvey. Garvey, um, uh, boy, it, it, he's such a hard person to sort of describe. Um, he quits school. Uh, he ends up working as an apprentice in a newspaper, newspaper making shop. Um, and uh, he, uh, he will eventually actually become the owner of the first um, black, uh, black owned newspaper in Jamaica. And Garvey is, in this society, in this world that constantly tells Blacks that you are not worthy, that you are not worth, that you are lower, Garvey, for some stunning re reason, just uh, stubbornly will refuse to believe it and believes that the Blacks are just being held down and everything needs to be different. He, um, he does a bit of traveling around. You know, he goes to the Panama Canal and he sees Blacks working at the Panama Canal, but they don't own the canal. Uh, they don't own the ships. They're on the ships. They're loading the ships, but they don't own the ships. They're in the fields, working in the fields, doing all the labor, but they don't own the produce of the fields, right? He says, we, you know, we're working in the factories, but we don't own the factories. And Garvey uh, says, you know, basically, where is the Black uh, nation? Where is the Black president? Where is the Black uh, king? And where is the Black flag? And Garvey decides that he, little old Marcus Garvey, will create all of this. And he starts his newspaper, and from that, he gives birth in Jamaica to the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, an organization for Black improvement. 
And this organization grows, he uh, gets money and dues from people, he founds schools and stuff like this. Um, it only lasts for a few years. Garvey is many things, but um, he, you know, he skirts rules. And what happens is the accountants looking at it over his books and the financing people start to realize that he's taking some of the money that's supposed to go to the school in order for himself to live. It's not that he's um, making himself rich. It's just he doesn't care about rules and stuff like that. You just do what you need to do and people get upset. Uh, and so the, the UNIA in Jamaica sort of uh, that, that's the end of his role there. Uh, and so what he does is he has to leave Jamaica. And so he leaves and he goes to our second location. And that is the United States. Garvey moves to America in 1916. And once there, he settles in Harlem. Uh, and Harlem, of course, is a powerful place for him to be in New York City. Uh, there, he again works at a print shop. And at night, he goes and speaks on street corners. And at first, he doesn't do very well. But he starts to, to watch... Um, uh, some American preachers and listen to them on the radio, like Billy Sunday, the, the famous sort of evangelical preacher. He starts to copy their style. He keeps improving his technique and he gets better. Uh, and he starts to travel around. He writes his own advertising pamphlets and on them, he describes himself as the honorable Marcus Garvey. He just gives himself a title. Uh, and it, it starts to work. He starts to sort of get more followers and stuff and uh, collect money where he's going. And so what he does is he starts up another UNIA, uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. He starts up a branch in New York City in 1917. When he starts it, it's just got 13 founding members. Uh, but with only, within only uh, three or four months, he's up to about 3,500 people. And then he does the other thing that he did in Jamaica, and that is he starts a newspaper. Uh, and the newspaper will really change everything. He starts what is called the Negro World. Uh, the Negro World features Marcus Garvey. He writes a column on the uh, cover page every week, but it also has a news of the world and arts. Um, and the idea of the paper is Garvey, you know, we're reading white newspapers by white columnists talking about white society, and we need our own thing, right? And so in the paper, um, Blacks are constantly told that they have no culture, that they have nothing, that they're like a lesser, you know, like a lesser species from dark Africa, right? No civilization and all of this stuff. And Garvey says, well, this is, this is just bollocks. And so he has Black people review books, right? Doing culture things, write poetry, write uh, music reviews, write reviews of theater, right? Uh, doing these sorts of commenting on the issues of the day. Look at us. We are cultured. We can be uh, intelligent and creative and all these sorts of things. Uh, Garvey's newspaper will just completely take off. It eventually grows to somewhere between 500,000 and 750,000 subscribers. Uh, it goes around the world. It reaches somewhere between 20 and 40 countries. It uh, eventually it will be translated into Spanish and French. Uh, it is considered a menace by whites everywhere. Uh, the British and stuff like that don't want it going to their colonies. They ban the newspaper, uh, but Blacks who work on the ships will um, secret them in, right? They'll hide them somewhere on their person and their belongings. Uh, people in Africa are reading this, uh, Canada, the Caribbean, Great Britain, all over the place. It's, it's just there, there's been nothing, uh, nothing like this. Uh, and part of it as well is that Garvey uh, counters this notion of dark Africa. He buys into something called, or uh, uh, this isn't invented by him, but he popularizes the idea of what's called Ethiopianism. Ethiopianism starts in Africa by, uh, by, Afri by Black Africans who are converted to Christianity. And as they read their Bible and they hear all this stuff about dark Africa and you have no civilization, in the Bible, there are references to Ethiopia. Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God. And so some Black Christians say, what do you mean we have no civilization? We literally have a civilization that's much older than you know, Great Britain or Germany or France or any of these places. This is back in biblical times. And so Ethiopianism is a counter to this argument about who has culture, who is capable of civilization. And so it replaces that narrative of dark Africa. And in Garvey's newspaper, he champions this. He's telling the people, we are cultured, we are civilized, we are smart. And we have ancient civilizations and a grand history, and we're even part of the Bible. And so the UNIA, UNIA really explodes. It ends up with somewhere, uh, I've read, there were two sources I found. One said 500 branches, and one said it might have been closer to 2,000. 
and as I say, somewhere between uh, 22 and 40 countries, eventually somewhere around 4 million members. It is at this point in time, unquestionably, uh, the largest black movement, international movement in history. Uh, so much so that in 1920, uh, he holds a convention uh, in New York City, and he, the, the organization is so big and they have so much money, they rent out Madison Square Gardens for a month for this convention. And look at Garvey and his people. They're all dressed in like military uniforms with these fancy, you know, peacock hats. This guy uh, just beside him looks like some kind of a scholar. Um, they don't actually, like they're not actually, um, Garvey has this policy that you just put on the uniform and take the title. And so they call themselves things like Lieutenant Sergeant, Major General, uh, Reverend Doctor. They didn't go to school. They weren't in the military. And on the one hand, it's partly, you know, what's the word? It's partly just superficial. Um, and at the same time, and this is a criticism made about Garvey, even, you know, by, uh, by Blacks as well. But at the same time, Garvey is so aware of the power of symbols, right? That the superficial actually matters. And that whites give each other titles and, you know, uh, certain uniforms, we can do this too. And so Garvey will do this. He'll dress as a scholar, as a businessman, as a military man. And uh, this uh, conference uh, convention goes on in New York City for a month. They have a huge parade in Harlem that uh, really gets the notice of, you know, of, of the, the wider newspapers. You can see here there's a sign, the new Negro has no fear, which for many whites is, at the time is a fearful thing. Uh, and during the convention, they make a declaration of the rights of the Negro peoples of the world. It includes a passage like this. We, the duly elected representatives of the Negro peoples of the world, uh, they really weren't, I think, the duly elected representatives, invoking the aid of the just and almighty God do declare all men, women, and children of our blood throughout the world's free citizens and claim them as free citizens of Africa, the motherland of all Negroes. We're going to return to that in a bit. Um, during this convention, uh, they, the declaration says that Negroes deserve the right to elect their own representatives, um, entitled to representation on the jury, and denounces the, the N-word and demands use of Negro with a capital N. And I, I've used the word Negro because it was the language that they were, that they were using. Uh, and they need a flag. And uh, Garvey says we need a flag. And so they design a flag, red, green, and black. Red for the blood of the patriots and the oppressed. Green for the green of Africa, that's the earth and vegetation of Africa, and black for its people. Uh, later, a yellow will get added for the wealth and sun of Africa. And to this day, if you look at African flags, overwhelmingly, you will find that they draw from these four colors. Uh, this flag will have, uh, just as his newspaper had impact um, in Africa, so, so will even, even the flag. Uh, and they design a motto, one God, one aim, one destiny. And Garvey, sitting here in the middle, dressed as some kind of royalty, uh, has himself made the provisional president of Africa, a government in exile. He's saying that we are the government of the people of Africa. We're a government in exile. Uh, you know, Garvey has many things. He is not shy, right? He makes bold claims, sometimes almost crazy claims. Um, but, but this is what he does. Uh, and he says, we need to go back to Africa. Uh, the, you know, there is, uh, at this point, the Zionist movement has um, taken off amongst Jews. This idea that we should go back to Israel and reclaim the land and create a Jewish state, which eventually they will. And the same idea is animating this. We need to go back to Africa and, and, and rule ourselves. And so Garvey decides to do something about this. And he starts the Africa Redemption Fund. In 1919, at the Treaty of Versailles, the, the European powers are dividing up the world. You know, they'll end up divide. This is when Iraq and um, Iran and Lebanon, all these countries get drawn on a map by a British and a French guy, and the British will own this and the French will own this. And uh, Garvey says, well, Africa should be for the Africans, right? It, it should be ours. And so we're going to go back. And in order to do that, we'll need boats. And so he starts a fund and he buys a boat. Um, there was uh, something called the White Star Line, which was a, a shipping line. It's, it had the Titanic. And then there was the Green Star Line, which was owned by some Arabs. And he starts the Black Star Line. Uh, and he buys a boat and he renames it the SS uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, the UNIA becomes more than a newspaper and, um, um, and uh, 
you know, a series of clubs. It is many things. Uh, many people, Blacks throughout the country are members of these clubs. They will go to the meetings. They're, they wear uniforms when they go to these meetings, military uniforms. I, I listened to tapes of probably people around the 1980s who had been little kids when their parents were members of the UNIA. And they talked about how their dad, you know, worked as a janitor. Had, most of them had low jobs, right? If you were black, you had no choices. But on Saturday, you would go to your UNIA meeting and you'd get on the bus in a military uniform. And everyone at the bus would stare at you, a black person in a military uniform, and the dignity it gave people. But on top of that, Gar Garvey also wanted the organization to be economic. Uh, he, uh, he creates the Negro Factories Corporate Corporation, which has like $3 million of capitalization. They own print shops, they own laundromats, they own grocers, they own uh, restaurants. He's like, we're black people, we're spending our money, let's spend them in black businesses. Uh, he has this entire organization. It is amazing. It is also a bit of a house of cards. Garvey does not promote competence uh, in leadership. He promotes loyalty. Those who don't question him, who are loyal, are running these organizations and they often don't know what they're, they're often not very good at it. Or some of them are, someone's running the grocery store and making good money, but the restaurant's going under. And so Garvey would just take the money from the, the enterprise that's doing well and fund the losses in the other one, right? He didn't care about ownership and stuff like that. Um, and so this whole thing is amazing and growing, but it's also, um, there is a ricketiness to the whole thing. And when he buys the boat, he doesn't really know what he's doing. He gets taken. Uh, they sell him a, a lame boat, basically. It needs expensive repairs, and it never does get to Africa. And so then he realizes that he needs to buy um, uh, another, another boat. Um, and um, by the way, yeah, his partner in buying the boat was actually an informant to the FBI, and he gets, he, uh, Garvey pays way too much for the boat and everything else. And at the FBI, there's this young agent, and this young agent's name is J. Edgar Hoover. He's young at this time, and Hoover writes uh, of, of Garvey, Garvey is a notorious Negro agitator, affectionately referred to by his own race as the Negro Moses. And Hoover will kind of have the job of going after Garvey. Uh, this will be the first time in the FBI's history that they use black informants. Uh, they have eight U.S. agencies investigating him, and there's actually an assassination attempt on him in 1919. He gets shot, but he, he survives. And Garvey writes, Unfortunately, the most important passage in this word in this whole passage is the word unfortunately. Unfortunately, Garvey has not as yet violated any federal law. That's not supposed to be what police agents say, right? Unfortunately, they've not violated laws, uh, whereby he could be proceeded against on the grounds of being an undesirable alien because he's not born in the United States from the point of view of deportation. But Garvey's ship, the, the Frederick Douglass, does not work. And so he needs another ship. And so what he does is he says, I'm going to buy another ship called the SS Phyllis Wheatley. And he sells shares in this ship. And what happens is you submit some money and you will get a share in the ship. And so what the FBI realizes that there is fraud here because he's selling shares in a ship that he's going to call the SS Phyllis Wheatley that he has not yet bought. So the share is in nothing. And so an FBI person um, buys a share for $25. It comes via the mail. And using this, this is mail fraud, and they arrest Garvey. And Garvey is cust uh, uh, arrested and taken off to prison. Uh, he's sentenced to five years in prison. And here is, uh, here is his prison record. Um, he, he gets ill in prison, and they're a little bit afraid he's going to die. And in 1927, heading up to a presidential election, uh, Calvin Coolidge uh, releases him from the sentence and has him deported. Um, they, don't, they don't want him dying in prison, but they deport him out of the country. And when he goes on the ship, uh, people line up on the shores and they see him, you know, leaving for, for Jamaica. Uh, he, he never really recovers from this. He goes to Jamaica. Uh, he starts up other newspapers and other ventures. He formed a political party, um, but it never works. Uh, people start laughing at him. They throw stones at him. The kids do in the streets. They call him names. He'll, and, he, and he's also not healthy anymore. And he moves to London in 1935. Uh, and then tragically, he suffers a stroke and uh, it gets reported that he died. And although he has not died, he, uh, the story is that he reads this in the newspaper. The, the thing not only says he died, it says um, that he was, uh, you know, a, a worthless person, that everything he did came to nothing. He's, he's a laughing stock. And Garvey reads this, it says, what it, the, the account is that he reads this and he sighs and he faints and he never wakes up again and he dies. 
Uh, and so Garvey is buried uh, originally in, uh, in England. Later, a generation or so later, people start to turn back to Garvey and to realize how much this man accomplished. And he is exhumed out of, uh, his grave is exhumed in England and he is brought to Jamaica and he is buried there as a kind of national hero. He's put on the money uh, and made the, the, the national hero of the country. There are now things named after Marcus Garvey all over the place. Uh, the public library in New York City, there's a boulevard in Brooklyn. Um, in Toronto, near where I live, there is Marcus Garvey Day. Uh, there's a school of African philosophy uh, named after him, the Marcus Gar Garvey Center for Leadership and Education um, all over the place. Uh, also in places like Jamaica, Kenya, Nigeria, Trinidad, Trinidad, all over the place. Garvey's influence is amazing. Uh, if you look at the accounts of the first leaders of independent African nations like Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, they were all members of the UNIA. They read his newspaper. The flag of Ghana looks a bit like the um, original flag for the UNIA, and the black star is from that black star shipping line. Uh, much of the ANC leadership, the African National Congress, this was the organization um, of Nelson Mandela, much of the early leadership of it belonged to the UNIA. Elijah Muhammad, who founded the Nation of Islam in the United States, was a member. Malcolm X's parents were both members. His father was actually an organizer for the organization. And the Negro world, that newspaper is uh, considered to have contributed to the Harlem Renaissance, which uh, was both musical, um, sorry, musical, artistic um, literature as well, Langston Hughes and Duke Ellington, and, uh, Billy Holiday, and folks like that. Uh, Martin Luther King writes, Garvey was the first man of color to lead and develop a mass movement. He was the first man on a mass scale and level to give millions of Negroes a sense of dignity and destiny and make the Negro feel he was somebody. His story is unbelievable. The guy had nothing but enormous chutzpah and a belief that Blacks were capable and that all they needed was to be shown a different world. Um, he could be, he had personal failings as well, uh, but what he did is, is quite astonishing. On top of that, Garvey did one more thing, and that is a number of times in his career, he said something to the effect of, look to Africa, for there a king will be crowned. He first says it in 1916, but he repeats it throughout the 1920s. Look to Africa, for there a king will be crowned. And so our story moves again, and now we move to Ethiopia. So you remember, that uh, Black Christians in Africa have realized that this story of dark Africa does not jive with the fact that Ethiopia is in the Bible. And some people, not, not just Blacks, but some people uh, have wondered whether the, uh, there's, in the Bible is also reference to the kingdom of Sheba, and some believed that this was actually in modern day Ethiopia. And in Ethiopia, on top of the Bible, there will develop later a, a um, a complementary set of scriptures. It doesn't replace the Bible, but elaborates on some stories. And in those stories, it talks about the, this um, kingdom of Sheba. And in the Bible, it references the queen of Sheba. And in these other scriptures that are in Ethiopia, it gives her a name. Her name is Queen Makeda. And in the Bible, uh, it describes uh, the queen of Sheba. And it says, when she heard of the fame of Solomon, King Solomon in Israel, she came to Jerusalem. So uh, accordingly, supposedly, she makes something like this trek. Uh, and it says in the Bible that when they meet, King Solomon gave unto queen of the Queen of Sheba all her desire whatsoever she asked. So he gives her everything she asked. Beside that which, beside everything she asked, he also gave her of his royal bounty. And uh, one perspective is that royal bounty here is a kind of euphemism, if you will. Uh, he, he gives her his euphemism, if you will. Uh, and uh, he impregnates her is the idea. And all of this is in that other scripture in uh, Ethiopia, which is called the Kebra Nagast, which means the glory of the kings. Uh, it starts as oral tradition, uh, but is probably written around the 13th century, either in originally in ancient Coptic, an Egyptian ancient language, or Arabic. And around, uh, and then in 1922 and in 1932, it is translated into English. This is exactly the time of Garvey, when Garvey is saying, look to, Ethiopia, or look to Africa, for there will be a king. Uh, the timing is really incredible. Uh, and so here's a sort of artist rendition. This is Solomon. This is the Queen of Sheba. And they're parting. She's leaving now. Um, I often teach this class in the context of teaching a series on world religions. 
And so usually when I teach this class, we've already had my class on Judaism. This, if you'd taken, uh, I, you know, if we'd had the other class, you would know what this is. This is a lion, of course, and it's a particular lion. It's called the Lion of Judah. Uh, the Jews are the survivors of the, um, uh, the Hebrews. The Hebrews had 12 tribes, and the Jews are those that remain. It's really two tribes, and the main one is the tribe of Judah, and so the word Jews comes. The Hebrews weren't called Jews. They were called the Hebrews, and then they were the Israelites. But the surviving remnant is from the tribe of Judah. You get the word Jews. All of the 12 tribes have a symbol. The symbol of the tribe of Judah is the Lion of Judah. And notice here where the lion is. It's not with Solomon. It's with her. Why? Because he is royalty. And what has he done? He has got her impregnated. And where does the royal line go? It goes with the oldest son. And the Lion of Judah, the, line, the royal line, is now with her. That's what this artist's rendition is. And that is the argument made in the Kebra Nagast. She will go home and she will give birth to a son named Menelik. And from this perspective, if he's the oldest son of the Jewish king, he is the Jewish king. And in the Kebra Nagast, it says that Menelik grows up and eventually he goes back to Jerusalem uh, to seek his father. And he finds his father and they talk and they sort of meet one another um, and he visits with him. And when it's over, he goes home. But when he goes home, uh, Solomon sends with him his inheritance. He sends with him some leading Jews and his inheritance. And his inheritance is up here. What is this? There's some kind of box on their head. These are some of the leading Jews who are going back with him. Uh, but there's also a box. And protecting the box are some angels. Anyone want to, you know, can you imagine what that might be? What, what would Solomon give him that would be protected by angels? Something from Jerusalem. And what it is, according to this perspective, is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, which is in the temple in Jerusalem, goes with Solomon's son and goes back to Ethiopia. And so where is the Ark of the Covenant today? It's in Ethiopia. The argument is that it is in this church, that it later, um, we'll get to the Christian side of this equation later, but that the Ark of the Covenant is still there. Uh, most Jews believe the Ark of the Covenant is gone. The temple was destroyed. They lost it. Um, but from the Ethiopian perspective, no, it came here to Ethiopia and it's in this church. Can you go see it? No, you couldn't go see it in the temple in Jerusalem either. It was behind a curtain and only the high priest could go one day a year. So you can't go see it. Um, but that's the argument is that it's there. And so in Ethiopia to this day, there are people who see themselves as Jews. Uh, they are called Beta Israel, which means the house of Israel. And they see themselves as the ancient and true Jewish lineage dating all the way back to King Solomon, which is about 3,000 years ago. Uh, sometimes they're also called the Falasha Jews, which means uh, the stranger Jews. They have earned the right to move to Israel. All Jews can move to Israel automatically. You don't have to apply or anything. If you're Jewish, you're, you're allowed to come. And they have earned this right, and they have come there. And there's issues sometimes of discrimination in Israel because people are like that. Uh, but this is uh, a, a group that, uh, that is Black, that is African, that is Ethiopian, that claims a Jewish lineage and uh, follows, in some cases, Jewish religion. Okay? So true Jews. But we're not done. Now, later, of course, you get the birth of Christianity. And, uh, and so remember that they're, they're Jews from the time of Solomon, so way back. So now, the birth of Christianity, very early in the movement, in the book of Acts, you have Philip talk to who? An Ethiopian. It's right there in your Bible, folks. And it says in the Bible, um, in, in the book of Acts, it says, now there was an Ethiopian who had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Now, what is an Ethiopian coming to Jerusalem to worship? Does that make any sense to you? And from this perspective, it does, right? Because he's Jewish, because the Jews are in Ethiopia. They're descendants of the line of Solomon, right? So that's why, right? If you're, if you're of this tradition, you're like, this all makes sense. The Bible aligns with our own traditions as well. Uh, so he meets, he meets uh, Philip. Uh, seated in his chair, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asked of, of this Ethiopian, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. And then Philip began to speak to him and proclaim to him the good news about Jesus. And the story in Ethiopia of the Christian church is that this guy is the first convert. And this is early, right? This is probably, we don't know the exact date of Jesus' death, but if Jesus' death is, let's say, 
30 C of the common era. Maybe this is 31 or 32, right? This is early um, in the account. And he goes back to Ethiopia and starts spreading the church. And so the, Ethi uh, the Ethiopian uh, Christian church starts very early. And to this day, you have the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And their argument is they are the ancient and true Christian lineage. Later, you will get the uh, Council of Nicaea, and the Christians will develop the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. And they say, we're before all of you guys. <laughs> we were there before you. You started inventing new doctrines and stuff, but we go back to the very roots. So that the ancient and true Jews, do you remember that line of Solomon? The ancient and true Christians. Okay, this is the context, the backstory in Ethiopia. All of this sets the stage uh, for this. This is the uh, ruling empress of Ethiopia in the early 20th century, the Empress Zuditu. She rules Ethiopia and she is childless. Um, and she has a long uh, lineage. She can trace her lineage all the way back to Solomon. They can tell you Solomon and Menelik and this person and this person all the way down to her. Uh, but she's going to die childless. And so it will go to her nephew. And who is her nephew? Her nephew is this little boy named Tafari Makunin. Uh, eventually he will grow up and he becomes the prince, Prince Tafari, and eventually will become the emperor, the ruler. Uh, in Ethiopia, they don't speak English, they speak Amharic. And in, in Amharic, the word for prince is Ras, Ras Tafari, Prince Tafari. Uh, and in 1930, he is uh, crowned as the emperor of Ethiopia. His, his aunt has died. Um, and there he is crowned. And at his crowning, at his invocation ceremony, they will read out his titles and his name. His Imperial Majesty, this is all his name, Power of the Trinity, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah, you get the reference there, we are the true Jews, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Incense of the Virgin, you get the reference there, we're of the Christian Church, Keeper of the Faith of the Dynasty of Judah, Jewish, Keeper of the Faith of the Dynasty of David, the True Descendants, and the Elect of God. This is kind of his royal name. Now, no one wants to repeat that name over and over and over again. And so sometimes they use his imperial majesty, uh, or just him, his imperial majesty, and they just use the first phrase, the power of the Trinity. But again, it's not English, it's on, on, on Amharic. And in Amharic, the way you say the power of the Trinity is Haley Selassie. Some of you will have heard of this guy, Haley Selassie. It's not his birth name. It means power of the Trinity. And so he becomes uh, the emperor, his imperial majesty, Haley Selassie. And in his temple, he will actually have lions to indicate that he is of the descendant of Solomon. He is the lion of Judah. He is the royal lion from David, from Solomon, all the way to down, down to him. And at this time, the flag of Ethiopia looks like this. Again, notice the color scheme looks familiar. And then what do they have there? The lion of Judah right? Jewish. And yet, what's he holding? A cross to Jews, to Christians, okay? And so there's Emperor Haile Selassie. Uh, he has a wife as well, the Empress. And uh, some people who um, sort of uh, see him in a particular light will refer to them as King Alpha and Queen Omega, right? You hear about Alpha and Omega in the Bible. Africa at this point had been heavily colonized. This is hard to see, this graphic, it's uh, small, but it just shows you who's colonized all of it. There is a little color, right? Um, you know, like there's French West Africa, the Belgians have Congo, the British have East Africa, Italians have Somaliland, but there is a little color right here, this little light yellow that the arrow points down to. It refers to the two places in Africa that haven't been conquered. One is, uh, I think it's Lesotho. It's a very tiny country in the West. And the other one is Ethiopia. The whole rest of the continent has been colonized, but Ethiopia has not. It has maintained its independence going back for centuries, indeed millennia. And so in Africa, there is a king. Uh, and this is such like stunning news, really. Uh, for some reason, this coronation really grabs the attention of the Western press. Um, and Haley Selassie ends up being uh, the man of the year in Time magazine, that there is a black king today who leads a nation. Uh, his is the first uh, black face ever to appear on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, but the Europeans are very rapacious, uh, they're colonizing. Um, they want glory, and there is this one place that is unconquered. And so Italy under Mussolini uh, invades Ethiopia in 1935. Uh, 
Haley Selassie goes to the League of Nations and appeals to them to tell Mussolini to back off. He gives a really impressive and impassioned speech. It's still quoted from today. Uh, he's really, I mean, he's right. There's no argument. Uh, but the European nations have this kind of detente and they don't want to interfere with Mussolini. It's basically their own politics over the freedom of the Ethiopians. Um, and the speech, as I say, really, um, uh, you know, uh, was got covered in the press and things like this. Uh, the League, however, voted not to support him. Uh, in 1936, Time Magazine actually makes him their, their person of the year. Uh, and eventually, uh, Ethiopia falls. It takes a, takes a while, but Addis Ababa, the capital, is conquered. And uh, Haile Selassie has to flee. Uh, he flees to England, and he will be a leader in exile for, uh, for a number of years. Okay, so that's a story in Ethiopia. Now, we're going to move back to Jamaica. Okay, we're doing okay. So we've got Garvey, we've got Selassie, we've got this biblical story. And into this wades another figure, and this figure is Leonard Howell. And Leonard Howell is sometimes referred to as the first Rasta. Howell is a very devout Christian. He reads his Bible over and over again. He knows it inside and out. And he starts reading it and listening to Garvey and looking at Selassie and reading the Bible and Ethiopia and the Bible and the true Jews and the true Christians. And he starts to see things. In the book of Genesis, it says, a river flows out of Eden to water the garden the same as it that encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Now, if the river that waters Eden flows out and waters Ethiopia, then where was the Garden of Eden? It was in Ethiopia, obviously, right? It says the Garden of Eden is in Ethiopia. It all starts in Ethiopia. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. So if everything starts in Ethiopia, everything's going to end in Ethiopia. In Ezekiel, he reads, in that day shall messengers go forth from me in ships. Remember this, this is a door of no return. Messengers shall go forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid. Great pain shall come on to them as in the day of Egypt, for lo, it cometh. You remember what happened in Egypt. They were enslaved. The Ethiopians will go in ships as in, in Egypt. They will be enslaved. Great pain shall come. It's all predicted in the Bible, you see. From the beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring my offering, right? From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my dispersed shall be somehow called together. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Howell is reading this, and he's saying, this is us. These are, these, this is us Africans, right? That we will be brought back to Ethiopia. And the Negro world, of course, this is exactly what Garvey was trying to do, right? He bought that steamship to bring people home. The, and then, it, then he reads in the Psalms, uh, how it reads, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than the dwellings of Jacob. The dwellings of Jacob, Jacob refers, Jacob's name is later becomes Israel. The dwellings of Jacob means the Israelis. But the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than the dwellings of Israel. Well, what does it say about the gates of Zion? Are the gates of Zion in Israel? Obviously not. He likes those gates more than the dwellings of Jacob. If it's not in Israel, where is it? It's in Ethiopia. Everything starts there. And of Zion, it shall be said, that man was born in her. What man was born in her? And the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writes of the people that this man was born there. And Howell says, I think I know who this is, right? It's this guy. It's Tafari Makunin. He reads on in Revelation. These shall wage war with the lamb, but the lamb shall overcome them, for he is king of king and lord of lords. Do you remember when I read to you all the titles of Haley Selassie? It literally said, king of kings and lord of lords. They shall wage war with the lamb. They're doing it right now. It's Italians attacking Ethiopia. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And he reads on, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. What is the Son of Man like? His head and his hairs were like wool. Is my hair like wool? It is not. Is Jean... Uh, 
you know, Jean Bellrose is Mary Jean Bellrose is her uh, hair like well, it is not right. Claire Shepardson, I don't think so, <laughs> right? But this man has hair like wool, right? And what else is he like? His feet like unto fine brass, as if burned in a furnace. My feet don't look like fine brass, but this man's might have, right? And Howell is reading this going, look, it couldn't be more clear. Therefore, a prophet, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to David that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things in the New Testament, uh, both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke try to show you that Jesus is descended from David. It's a hard claim to make. They have to claim a genealogy of a thousand years with no, you know, no record keeping or anything. Jesus is kind of a, you know, his parents are nobodies. How do you, you know, can you trace your genealogy back a thousand years, even with computers and governments that have had record keeping for four centuries? Probably none of you can, right? So they both create these lineages. Their two lineages don't actually match. It's kind of a problem. But this guy, this guy is royalty, right? And supposedly they can trace his lineage all the way back to David. And it says in the Bible that the Messiah will be a descendant of David. And so who is the Messiah? Who is the King of Kings? Who is the Lord of Lords? Who is Christ? And the argument is, Powell saying, it's this guy. And it says in Revelation, every eye shall see him. And they did. They put his face on the most famous magazine in the world. Every knee shall bow. When he was coronated, people from around the world, leaders came and they bowed at the coronation. And so he is his imperial ma majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie, the true and living Jah. Jah is a short for Jehovah. And so some start to see him as essentially the Christ, as part of the Trinity, as part of God. Right? And so this is Haley Selassie, right? Uh, the, the real, the real Messiah, if you will. Maybe Christ come again, maybe, maybe instead of Christ, there's different interpretations. And you can get a Bible like this. I have it up here on my wall, the African Heritage Study Bible. It's a King James Bible, and there's all these annotations at the bottom that gives you sort of these perspectives. And so uh, Howell writes and others write, and they start seeing Selassie as Jesus come again, as somehow the reincarnated Christ. Um, and they see Selassie essentially as the Messiah, as a symbol of Black dignity, a Black African king, and the promised one, the promised Messiah who will lead them out of slavery and lead them back uh, to freedom in the land of milk and honey in Africa. Eventually, he travels to Jamaica, where he is a rock star, essentially. He travels in 1966. Uh, they welcome him. There's, there's people mobbing wherever he goes. Um, they have all these things. Jamaica welcomes the emperor of Ethiopia. Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, and, they, and Selassie says of them, you Jamaicans, you are Ethiopian by creation. Okay, and, uh, and then he, he, and he quotes, uh, he quotes uh, uh, the book of Jeremiah. He says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spot? Meaning you might be here, but, but you know, you're, you're still Ethiopian, really. Um, and by the way, someone asks him point blank, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? And he says, no. Uh, but all of the, the Rastas will say, well, of course, that's what he's going to say. He's not going to tell you, right? That just proves more or less what he is. And so this is, this is the unbelievable sort of confluence here, right? Is that you have these biblical stories of Ethiopia and of oppression and slavery and freedom and of a promised Messiah. Uh, you have Marcus Garvey, who popularizes a lot of these notions and makes Blacks think that it is their day, and who says a king will be born in Africa, turn to Africa, a king will be born, and into this unbelievable set stage walks an African king, Haley Selassie. And so this is how Rasta is formed, Black power, biblical messianism, and the story of Haley Selassie. Okay, uh, that's the story, folks. Um, that's the roots. I'm a little behind on time, so I'll go quickly here. I want to tell you, so what is the, tra the tradition about? Five key traits. One, the centrality of Haile Selassie, uh, who is in some ways or another often considered divine. Second, what is called I and I consciousness. Uh, I and I consciousness, the I is the key, the divine in oneself. Blacks were so often an object of history. They're enslaved, they're bought, they're sold, things are done to them. And I and I consciousness says, uh, me is an object. This was done to me in, gr in grammar, right? But I is the subject. I choose to do this. And so it is the I in, the, in, in yourself, the I and I, and, the, and that you are an agent. You have the divine in yourself, right? 
I as subject, not object. Uh, third, dread talk. Uh, what they do is, uh, you know, in Jamaica, the, the, the whites sort of own the sophisticated language, the Oxford, you know, language, the Oxford accent and diction. And to be intelligent, you have to sound like them. And eventually some of them say, well, this is ridiculous. Why should we copy the accent and diction of our oppressor in order to sound intelligent? If you go to school enough and become learned, then you start talking like the oppressor and start seeing your own family and the people who nurtured you as unintelligent and you know inferior. And so it is a rejection of that, that we will not copy the Oxford accent, we will have our own thing. And they also create new words. Uh, they argue that words have power, that sounds and meanings should align. And so a word like oppression makes no sense to them because it sounds like up, up, up oppression. But oppression doesn't let, bring you up, it knocks you down. And so instead of oppression, they say down pressure. They have a lot of words like this. They use jaw for Jehovah or God. Instead of creator, they use the I a lot, the subject, the irator, iration for creation, ivanity for divinity, for Iver. Sometimes they even say Ethiopia. And Haley Selassie was the first, Haley Selassie the first. So they sometimes call them Haley Selassie. I, and sometimes you'll hear them say Haley Selassie. I. There's other words, Babylon. Babylon's a biblical term, but here it means uh, modern society. Babylon's where you went for captivity in the Bible. And so it's modern society and the oppression of the modern world. Zion. Uh, Zion can be a place, the Holy Land of the Rastas, which can be Ethiopia or Africa more, more generally, uh, but sometimes it's understood more of, of the condition of living in righteousness. They don't like isms and schisms. Uh, they don't like uh, systems. Systems oppress you. Capitalism, colonialism, um, all of these sorts of things. Uh, and so it's not, you do not say Rastafarianism. You don't say that. It's Rastafarian and Rastafari, but no isms and schisms, and they promote instead one love. And this is why Bob Marley sings that song, One Love. Okay, so Haley Selassie Central, I and I consciousness of being a subject, and dread talk. Fourth are dreadlocks. They wear dreadlocks. Um, they reject Babylon's notions of, of grooming. It is important to understand how much the humiliation of Blacks was also that they were considered like, you know, um, uh, ugly, essentially. The standard of beauty was white. Uh, if you ever heard of, um, uh, you know, if you ever watched the movie of Malcolm X, uh, Malcolm X is putting lye in his hair. It's like burning his skull. They would put lye in their hair because it would turn their hair soft and straight like my hair. It looks like European hair. And so dreadlocks rejects this. It depicts Africanness as beautiful, right? Curly hair, coarse, thick hair. Uh, it is said to symbolize the lion's mane, like the lions of Judah. And some understand that the dreadlocks have power. They can somehow channel sort of the power of God, of Yah, of Jah that pervades creation. And they say it's in the Bible. You guys have read your Bible. Remember Samson? What was the strength of Samson's power? It was his locks, locks of hair. And there's another group you might not know as well in the Bible called the Nazarites. In the book of Numbers, there's the Nazarite vow. And the vow of them is that all the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head and he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow, right? And when you read about this locks, you know, the argument is that people like you and I don't get locks. Who does? Blacks, right? Because they are, they are the true Jews, if you will. Okay, and so dreadlocks. And fifth is livity. And livity is a natural diet called ital. It comes from the word vital, ital that taps into Jaws power, Jaws power. What does the diet look like? Uh, it's about nature. So natural and organic foods are good. Processed and canned foods are bad. Uh, many of them are only vegetarians uh, and therefore do not eat meat. There are some who will eat meat and some of those who eat meat though will follow the Leviticus dietary codes. So you don't eat pork and your meat should be kosher and stuff like that. However, it means everything natural is good, and therefore herbs, including ganga, uh, marijuana, is good. Um, but any processed drug, like cocaine, heroin, alcohol, cigarettes, these are bad. They, they do not contribute to your well-being. And so people have this idea of the permissiveness of Rasta because of the marijuana, but they don't drink a beer if they're devout. They won't smoke a cigarette. Um, they won't eat meat, right? That's not very permissive, is it? Like there's marijuana, but there's quite a bit of strictness to this. 
Why ganga? Um, as they say, they say it's natural. And they say, when you smoke marijuana, what does it do? Alcohol leads to people like abusing their family, right? But marijuana, you know, getting violent. Marijuana fosters peaceful emotions. It fosters harmony. It opens up the mind to I and I consciousness. They smoke casually and sometimes in ritual settings. They say it's biblically justified. In Genesis, the opening book, God says, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which means marijuana. And in the closing book in Revelation, on each side of the river stood the tree of life and the leaves of the tree are the healing of the nations. What tree leaf do you know that heals a nation? Does the maple leaf, does an oak leaf? No, but marijuana leads to peace, right? Leads to, to getting along. Okay, so there's the five key traits. Uh, just quickly, I'm gonna start to run through the last few slides. They don't distrust structures. They don't have official priesthood or buildings. They have meetings that are more casual than informal. They call them reasonings where they discuss the news of the day, they discuss Rasta teachings. They sometimes do dancing and drum, drumming, uh, things like this. They do have festivals called Nayabingis. Um, I often take people to this uh, Rasta shop uh, where we get a kind of a reasoning from the, the leader there. A Nayabingi is a more major festival and things like this. Haley Selassie grows to be old, but there's a Marxist revolution in 1974. They imprison him and uh, uh, um, take him away, essentially. And so the so Solomonic dynasty, the Lion of Judah dynasty is over. Uh, they change the flag. They put their flag like this. They get rid of that Lion of Judah. And eventually Selassie dies in captivity. Some Rastas deny that he died, that it's not possible that he died, that it's a lie, that he's gone into hiding. There are different mansions or houses. They don't have isms or schisms, but really they have varieties of opinion like everybody else. Uh, different views on, on how these five things go. So some of them see Haley Selassie as divine. Some just see him as a great devout Christian. Some say you have to have dreadlocks. Some say it's a good thing, but you don't have to have them. Some say you must follow Aital. Some say it's more like a good thing. Some say blacks are supreme over whites and others teach equality for all. And some teach a fairly harsh form of patriarchy and others fight for women's equality. Um, the patriarchy, uh, for many black communities, there was a view that whites elevated black women to emasculate black men like the nation of Islam taught this. And they drew on biblical fundamentalism in the book of Leviticus and sayings of Paul's. Um, and this means that sometimes women were considered unclean during their period by some groups of Rastas. And there were dress requirements to dress modesty modestly to cover their hair and no makeup. Makeup is fake. It's a process. It's not natural. And that you should reject the capitalist marketing sort of of women's bodies. In some groups, they were excluded from smoking ganga and from the reasonings, but in others, they were included. And some argue there should be no contraception or abortion, which are the white man's attempts to erase the black men. And there are feminist counter movements. Okay. Uh, Bob Marley, if you listen to his songs, it's all, it's all religion. Iron Lion and Zion, right? Babylon by bus, African herbsmen, one love. Okay, that's all folks. I took the entire hour, I'm sorry about that. I hoped for time for questions. Do we have time for one question? If so, fire away. We have as much time as we need. Oh, good. Okay. Have any questions on game? I think Danny's got a question. I don't have a question, uh, Brian. Fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, Thank you're you. Just wonderful uh, in, in detailing that. I, I had a couple of comments that may or may not be worthwhile. Uh, one of them is the, the whole issue of uh, mysticism that mm -hmm. is found within every, every religion, including ours, of course. And yet our tendency, and I'm not being over critical, but our tendency is to look at the mystical beliefs of other uh, disciplines of, of theology and religion and say, oh boy, that's, that's crazy, that's crazy. And we forget to look at our own <laughs> and see that it is on the same basis as unreasonable in a sense as, as someone else's. The other comment has to do with this issue that you brought up in your lecture about the, the power of words. And I was thinking about that in terms of the fact that, you know, uh, from our concept and probably many other religions as well, the idea that the word has the power to create what it says. And I guess in our language uh, today, we might refer to that as word magic. Mm -hmm. And and we may say, we, again, we look at these other 
uh, faith movements and say, well, you know, really, come on, we, we, we're sophisticated. We, we don't believe in word magic. You don't think so? Well, sit beside somebody in an airplane and uh, say, well, I hope this doesn't go down. <laughs> Did you read yeah. about that plane that went down? I'll tell you something. Don't, if you ever said, don't talk about it. Don't, don't talk. Don't, don't say that. Why? Because if you say it, it just might happen. Yeah. That's great, Danny. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, I'm really, really glad you said both those things. Yeah, uh, I sometimes taught in class, uh, a lot of ancient cultures in particular really uh, had a different philosophy. As you say, we still have it somewhat, but they had this philosophy more so. Um, you guys will all know the story of um, Isaac and um, uh, Isaac and Jacob in the Bible, right? Isaac uh, is an old man and he goes blind and he wants to give the patriarchal blessing to his older son, uh, Esau. You guys remember this? Um, and uh, uh, Isaac, or Jacob finds out about it and he tricks his father and uh, makes his father think he's Esau. Do you remember this? He dresses like his brother and all of that, you remember? And, and so Isaac gives him the blessing and he runs away. And then when Esau shows up, the father realizes his mistake, but he says, oh, it's too late. I gave the blessing to the other son. When a modern person re reads this, it's a bit of a strange reading because what you think is, well, just fix it and <laughs> give the blessing to him. But that is because most of us have been trained in this idea that words convey intent that intent is what matters. But for many ancient peoples, when you spoke it, words had power. It's like, it's like I didn't intend to bake the cake for five hours too long. It doesn't matter, right? It's baked now. Um, and we have vestiges of this in our view and in our law, in our society. And Danny, you just highlighted some. We have other vestiges. You know, if you say I do in, in certain setting, you can't say the next day I, I didn't mean it. Um, uh, a man wearing a black robe in an oak paneled room, if he hits his hammer and says guilty, cannot come back after lunch and say, you know, I didn't eat breakfast. I think I was hangry. I'd like to have that back. Something happened, right? It was like a little, the word had power. Um, and so, um, and your examples were great, Danny, and there's some of that. Um, yeah, and I could say more about the mysticism, but I think I'm talking too much. So I'm gonna, I'll be quiet. Th thanks for that. Uh, Claire. You were talking earlier about uh, Haiti Selassie as kind of being the king or the, the Messiah sort of thing. Is there a conflict there between him and Christ? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question, Claire. And I, the, uh, the question is, it sort of depends. Uh, Rastas are not of one mind on this front. So some of them see him as the real Christ and Jesus kind of wasn't. Um, others see him as Christ reborn and others see him more as a very devout Christian. Um, so uh, those, I think those are like the three possibilities and different Rastas sort of inhabit all three of them. Um, but they do see him as, you know, some see him as, uh, as a part of the Godhead, you know, as Christ maybe come back or something like that. And they do, to be clear, consider themselves Christians. Christian as a follower of Christ? Yeah, that's right. Now you still have to decide who Christ yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> Is Christ Jesus? Is it Haley Selassie? Or, or are those two really one? Um, a lot of them think that, that Haley Selassie is Jesus, essentially reborn. Uh, Brian, <coughs> Brian, when all of this was going on, um, I mean, Haley Selassie is kind of caught in the middle. He yeah. didn't ask for any of this. He didn't claim any of this, right? Yeah. And, 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 is any of this happening in Ethiopia, or is it only a phenomenon of Jamaica and the U.S.? Uh... Yeah, great question. Uh, there's a little bit of it in Ethiopia, but it's it's in Jamaica that it really um, is the center of it, I guess. Um, some of them will even move to Ethiopia, actually, uh, and they'll form their own little communities there. Um, and some of them come from the United States, the sort of return to Africa movement and stuff like this. Um, so to this day, there is some Rastafarian um, perspectives in Ethiopia, but it, um, it's never as big there as it was in Jamaica. Yeah, it's a great story, I think. It's an amazing story. Susan. What, um, do they have sacraments like our church, like, do they do communion, or, and how uh, do they worship? Yeah, they they don't have. Um, uh, well, so 
some, some Rastafarians go to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, um, which they see as the original true Christian church. So some of them will go there and then they have Rasta things on the side, right? So they do their own reasonings. And it's almost like they're, they're taking the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which does not see Haile Selassie as the Christ, and then they're adding their own stuff. They're, they're combining the two. Um, but if you're just, if you don't do that, if you just go to Rasta gatherings, um, they don't have any kind of regular ritual or anything like that. Um, the re I mean, the regular thing that they do, um, but it's not so like um, liturgical as, for example, communion can be, but the regular thing they do is, is smoke marijuana, that marijuana is considered sacred and is smoked ritually, um, but not liturgically, if you know what I mean. The whole thing has a more um, organic feel, a, a, you know, an informal sort of approach to it. Yeah, Amy, <laughs> I guess yeah won't work. Sorry, still working on pairs. Um, um, you said processed drugs weren't okay. Uh, Marijuana is okay. So I'm wondering about the stuff like CBD oil, since it's kind of like separated, manufactured separately mm. from the plant. Does that count as processed? And is that okay? That's a good question, Amy. Amy, uh, and I actually don't. I don't know the answer to that. I've not asked someone from the tradition. Um, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if their views on that would vary. This is another one of those traditions where like there's no Pope, right? Uh, many of us from Christian traditions are used to like, there's a prophet, there's a Pope, there's a president who kind of, is, or some council that can set doctrine. And, you know, when there's debates, they give like the answer. Um, but a lot of traditions, Muslims, Hindus, um, don't have this and Rasas don't have it either. And so what that means is that there's no final words. You probably get would get um, a variety of perspectives on it. Yeah, I just wondered because the difference between the CBD oil, like since CBD oil does have healing, like yeah. uh, healing and calming effects, it's the THC that gets you high. So I wondered which part of it was okay and which part was, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I actually want to ask my guy now that you said that. That's a very good question. My suspicion is that he would be in favor of it, but um, but I, I am speculating a little bit. Speculating a lot, actually. <laughs> well, I'm wondering if it has to do with processing. With marijuana, you just pick the leaves and there's nothing to do with them. To extract oil from something, or if you look at opium, to, you know, it comes from poppy seeds, but you still need to process it somehow to get it to that point. Whereas marijuana, no processing, it's just ready to go. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's two things. I think it's what you just said, Scott. I think the other thing is the idea that they, they see it as good. Because tobacco is another thing that you really can um, just sort of smoke. Uh, but their argument is that tobacco um, you know, harms you in a way that they would say marijuana does not. Um, yeah, so it's interesting because you know sometimes I'm dealing with indigenous folks for whom tobacco is, of course, massively sacred. And then you go to another community and it's it's on the thou thou shouldn't list. Um, so it's interesting. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Any oh, sense of how big the community is? <clears throat> you know, uh, I I think it's that's a good question, Lou. I have looked that up, but it's been a while. I believe it is in like the single digit millions. Right, so like like five million or something like that. I, I think it's something like that, um, but I I I I knew that and I've kind of forgotten. Uh, I've some of you've heard me say this before. I've gotten to this age where uh, you know when I was forty, I knew more than I did at thirty, but at fifty, I know less than I did at forty. You know how that happens? There's that little curve. I am over the hump now. I'm finding I I'm like I used to know that. Um, but uh, I, I can't remember. You're just, that you're just a kid. I can't remember anything. Who are you anyway? And what were we talking about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. After a uh, while, you just start to make it up because you realize nobody can prove you're wrong. Doing that <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I did want to add something about what Danny said earlier about the, um, uh, the mysticism, too. There is another element here. It's kind of adjacent to what Danny was saying, I guess. It's not the same because uh, mysticism is not confined to this. But the other thing is hallucinogens. Um, I don't know if you saw this. There's been some really interesting uh, discoveries recently in Israel of finding 
um, hallucinogens in some of the remains of worship sites in Israel. Um, like one was a model of the temple because um, the temple was destroyed, but there was, a, there was a smaller same floor plan temple just a few miles away. And they found evidence there was hallucinogens like in the, in the remains that were used there. Um, of course, many First Nations. Um, and so there is some speculation about the use of hallucinogens. Uh, and uh, as I say, many First Nations, and you get that here, right, with, with marijuana. Marijuana is not, um, I don't know if you quite call it a hallucinogen, but, but um, you know, throughout history, people have used substances to create a different mental state, right, to open oneself. And for, um, for Rastas, it's not, like we're all used, we all grew up in the age of the war on drugs, right? Drugs is like, it ruins people's lives. But many communities used drugs for eons in more ritual settings without many of the harms that we're used to. They didn't have crack um, and saw it really as an aid, you know, um, something that, and I don't know if you guys follow, like hallucinogenics are coming back. There are massive studies going on now at John Hopkins University, and it's all over the New York Times and on TV that uh, they're realizing that they, they over condemned these things, that they're using it to treat addiction because you can't get addicted to um, hallucinogens. And uh, they're using it to treat uh, PTSD and all sorts of stuff. Um, so I, I, I think our, our culture, I'm not sure, is very wise on this topic. Um, I realize it can be very harmful too, um, but I, uh, somewhere in there, there's a, um, you know, a lot of traditional cultures, I think, used it wisely, which they knew it was powerful. And so they structured it in a system of ritual and belief and a worldview that could allow people to use it in ways that are good. And I, I, it's coming back. Um, I, I guarantee you, you watch the news the next four or five years, you're going, uh, just open your eyes. It's all, you can Google it. It's all over the place. It's, it's coming back. So um, anyways, that was a bit of an aside. Um, I'm not, not being facetious at all, but in another sense, uh, we all use drugs. Wish you could see the number of pills that I have to pop now. Yeah. Uh, and, and these are things that we feel will help us, but sometimes they can do just the opposite if, if they're not treated properly. And that's obvious, but I just thought I'd throw that in because I haven't said anything for 10 minutes. <laughs> well, well, well said, though. Yeah, caffeine, too. Yes, yeah, someone wrote in the chat. Anyone else? Um, if not, th this has been fun. I've really enjoyed this. It's nice uh, seeing some of you. I haven't seen some of you in a while. And um, yeah, Ross, the Fra Safari tradition is just fascinating. I just think it's really interesting. So I appreciate you being here because I like telling it, but you have to have people to tell it to. So thank you all for, for coming. Well, thank you very much, Brian. As always, we could go on forever with these things. I find them so fascinating myself that I never want them to end because there's always more and more that I learn and I could just eat all this stuff up all day long. Anyways, again, thank you so much for a fascinating encounter and hope that we get to do this again really soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Goodbye. Bye.